one of the things about websites, they're never done, right? Meaning that you, um, it doesn't mean you set it once and you forget it, especially if you're selling retail products, because chances are you have seasonality. Maybe there's different products that are spring versus winter. Maybe you have a Christmas something that people are going to start buying like now as they're thinking, starting to not real early, back to school, whatever, right? You're going to rotate different things off or feature and highlight different things. Now, there's two things to think in mind. One, um, kind of, you don't want to put anything and everything out there at the same time, because when it gets overwhelming, people freeze up. They don't take an action. They don't know what to do because there's just more and more and more. That said, um, that doesn't mean your page should just be this long, right? You know, you've got, you've landed on pages and they have one paragraph and they make you click and it just feels old fashioned. Part of the things that are uh, evolutions or trends, if you will, is because of the mobile browsing. We don't like making pages load. So let's take ESPN, for example. CNN is another one. That if you're going on those pages on the mobile site, they have an almost infinite scroll. So you can keep, you know, you can actually put a lot of information. So if you are selling products, put your top products, the things that people want to do first, right? And then, but if you want to kind of have a continuous roll of products, you can absolutely do that. Um, one of the things though, I'm going to, I don't want to dig too deep in because um, I know it'll make your eyes roll back is paying attention to your analytics. If you don't know what people are clicking on, if you don't know what they want, or they don't know what your top projects are, or maybe, you know, you kind of have an idea of trends, take a look at the numbers. If you have a website, you should definitely have Google Analytics installed. It is free. Like I can even have like this pretty guide put together on how to get it started. Um, but that's going to start telling you the things that people are looking at on your website. Because I do get asked that a lot. If I have a good social media presence, do I still need a website? And the answer is yes, because there is a lot of consumers out there that they don't actually trust the business if they can't find it online, specifically if they don't have a website. And when I talk to a lot of my customers about the reasons be behind having a website, some people want to sell stuff, some people want to give documents to download and all of that's great. But the vast majority of people that come to me say, I just want to establish my credibility. When somebody heard, hears my name, when I meet them networking, I want them to have a place that they can go and check out and see me and see all the things that I do and just kind of check that box that yes, I'm who I say I am. Now, I also hear a lot of different approaches to websites. Some people say, oh, I'm not gonna worry about the design because the words are important. Uh, and yes, that's true, but here's the thing. We have the attention span that is smaller than a goldfish. A goldfish has an attention span of eight seconds. These days, people give you six seconds to figure out if they are going to trust your business by landing on your website. And quite frankly, that is all in the design. Um, we've actually had seen a lot of studies, like Harvard did a study and they found out prettier websites inspire more trust. Now, pretty can mean a lot of things, but just, you know, you, you know you've gone to the websites and they hurt your eyes physically. That's not praise, right? If social media is going to be your marketing channel, and I think we had a discussion in one of the sessions when we were in person, you don't have to do social media. You can run a business without being on social media. But if you are going to be on social media, you need to be posting regularly, you need to be consistent, and you need to share information. One of the biggest mistakes that I see about um, so people doing social media is they either only, they only post when they're having the event or they post something they did for their clients um, or it's, it's me, 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 me. Again, customers don't care about you. They want to know what's in it for you. So do you want to be able to feature promotions and highlight the work you can do? Yes. But you also want to be able to share useful information. Now, I'm going to give you an example. When I adopted one of my dogs, I did pro bono um, social media and marketing for this dog rescue organization. And the thing is, like, you can't just say, adopt this dog, adopt this dog, adopt this dog. Yes, they all need to be adopted. And we want to share that regularly. But that means nobody's, if nobody's in the market, like, thinks they're ready to adopt the dog, they're not going to stay and follow you because they're not getting anything out of it. 
So what we did is we put together a program and we had a different day for everything. So for instance, like Tuesday, we did training tips. Here's how to sit your teach your dog how to sit play dead, whatever it is, kind of tips and tricks that you can go. Um, one day we featured famous dogs. One day we did breed profiles. Now at the bottom of all of these posts or pieces of information, yes, we had a really cute adoptable dog that, oh, maybe you just can't live without. And you know, the adoptions did go up, but we gave people a reason to stay with us even when they weren't specifically thinking of adopting a dog. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, you may not have cute dogs to put out all the time, and, but what you can do is you have knowledge, you have information, you have tips. And even if you don't, there's so much out there. Share articles from the New York Times, share articles from Washington Post. Bob puts stuff out all the time in resources. Amanda has tons of stuff. Use things from your fellow entrepreneurs, from your connections that makes sense to share with your audience. You don't have to do it yourself because there is tons of information out there. Yes. When I'm actually putting together strategies for clients for social media, what we usually do is we come up with five to 10 sources. Like I said, maybe that's the New York Times, maybe it's Bob, whatever it is, but these are people that you know, they're in our industry or kind of similar, do similar things to us that are credible sources. And so when we know we need to share something because we haven't done it in a few, few days, but we have nothing to say, we can go to this list of 10 and say, okay, well, what have they done lately that we can take advantage of and share to our audience? First so, of all, um, what is your business? Okay. So I work with other businesses, which means LinkedIn is really my primary place. The other thing is I sit in front of my computer all day and yes, my dogs are on my desk and I can post pictures of them, but I'm not doing that much exciting. And so like putting stuff, I don't have a ton of pictures on Instagram to put out um, and people are there to, you know, they're looking at National Geographic, they're looking at pretty photos. Um, me and my computer, not so great, right? So Instagram is not where I focus on, LinkedIn is. So think about your type of customer. If you are a consultant, and you're doing business with other businesses, LinkedIn is probably going to be your primary one. The other thing is I have some customers that come and they say, well, everybody tells me I should be on Instagram, but I really hate it. All right, don't do it. If you hate it, it's going to come through. It's not going to be fun. It's not going to be exciting. And it's going to be a labor for you to do. So the thing I think I referenced, I said earlier, you don't have to be on social media. Um, if you, if it's not something that you like, or that you have the time for, don't do it, do other things that you get more of a benefit off of. Um, the other part is though, is looking at your customers. When we do strategies, most of the time as we talk about, and we say, all right, who are the customers that we want to buy, that we want to talk to, and where are they? Um, to give you a concept, if we want to talk to Bob, that is a very different customer than 15 year old girl, right? They're both very uh, great people, probably both. Maybe there's a little bit of overlap with Facebook and Facebook groups and all that, but the teenager is going to be on Instagram and TikTok and Bob's going to be on Facebook, maybe LinkedIn, right? So think about where your customers are. So there is not a one size fits all. One thing I will say about Facebook, um, Facebook has become what we call a pay to play medium. If you want to build an audience, you're going to need to have an ad budget to it. And you're going to need to get, even if you have a million followers, you're still going to need to put ads to get your, your posts out to those. It's kind of annoying. Um, but I will say Facebook groups is become a huge part. Even when, when I talk to college students or some of the kids, um, their Facebook feels old. It's not where they want to focus on, but they do get on it to participate in some of the groups. So, and I know 100 Entrepreneurs has a group. There's a ton of veteran groups out there yes. because in groups, like people are willing to talk to you. And when you yeah. find, you know, it's like-minded people, right? Like this group is a really supportive group and they're willing to answer questions, share information, same type thing. You might not know these people, but in, if you can find a similar you know, type of online community in Facebook, they're going to be more receptive to what you have to say and sharing and helping you. So 
Think of that, like the, the thing that people forget is that social media is supposed to be social. We don't just post, post and blast information about there. Yes, sometimes it does feel like you're talking to yourself. I'm not going to lie. And with um, since about March or no, let me say since about June of last year, like when we first locked down for the pandemic, everybody went to social media because you didn't have anything else to do. And then it started to be, people got exhausted by social media and kind of felt like Zoom, that you were on it all the time and there was nothing new. And so people are still viewing social media, but they're not talking and engaging as much. That said, there's still value. And I see when I look at my client's stats, if they're doing social media regularly, they're getting more traffic to their website, Google's paying attention to them, and there's whole bunches of other benefits. Okay. So MailChimp specifically, this is an email service. And if you're not sure what an email client is, when you do marketing emails, um, it keeps your list of people that they mail to. You can make them pretty, like you can do just text emails, which has a thing, or you can make them really pretty and put colors and photos in it, but it manages your list. It also keeps you compliant because Technically, there are rules um, that you have to give somebody an option to opt out of your email. So when I hear, when I see people that they send, you know, they have a list on their personal email and they send it to a hundred people, but there's no way to get off that list. That's actually technically illegal. So one of the things of using email is it makes it easy to design and broadcast and plan, but it also keeps you compliant. Now, MailChimp specifically, I have a ton of clients and small business sales on MailChimp because it fits for, it It coordinates with everything. You want it to work with QuickBooks. You want it to work with Zoho. You want it to connect to your website. Great. It does all of that type of stuff. Um, it is a freemium service, meaning that you can, I think I want to say they give you like five, up to 500 people. Um, on your list and they don't have all the bells and whistles. But to Earl's point, when you're first starting out, because maybe you only have an email list of 50, that's okay. It's going to grow. It's going to take a little bit, but it manages that for you. And so um, usually starting out with one of the freer plans and mail, like I said, there's tons of them out there. MailChimp works with a lot of things. Um, Convert Kit, that gets into a little bit more of a sophisticated system where something called sales funnels or drip campaigns, where you've got a series of five or eight emails that trigger on different times and different things. That's what something like Convert Kit is going to help you do. Now you can do that type of stuff and MailChimp. Um, but convert kit, I'm not sure, you know, when you're first starting out, every dollar counts. So I'm not sure I would pay. Like if you just want to be able to send an email um, once a month, once every couple of months, um, I would probably start out with the free stuff and wait until you know what you really need, because there's some of them, um, like there's one called Get Response that you can create promotional landing pages. You can have webinars. You can do all kinds of different stuff under the same account that you're doing your email on. So um, a lot of the things in the same, like when I, uh, I start with a lot of people that they have a website just to get something out there, right? And maybe it lasts them for six months, maybe two years. But a lot of times they come to me and they say, okay, it's time to get something better. I didn't know what I wanted to say. I didn't know what I needed to share, but now I know who I am and I'm ready to invest and glow. Think of email or any of your tools like that. Start out with the basics, save your money. And then when you know what you really need, that's the time to upgrade. 